you can feel like a coal in the room. And then Saddam walks in. And it is Saddam. And we were told about doppelgangers and all sorts of stuff. Um, flipping on, mate. I've never, sh- I was never been so scared in my life. And you could feel it in your hairs. We just standing on the, I could physically see the hairs on the guys in front of me. And we had some tough cookies with us, right? You know, and it was like flipping, Nora, this is surreal. And Saddam came in and he had an interpreter alongside, he had Tariq Aziz as well, and bollocked the UN. And he was giving it large, you know, and we were just there going, flipping out, oh my God. What if he now launches and realizes that there's Western, that there's two Westerners in the room as well, you know, who shouldn't be here. As he found out, and all this is going through in the back of your mind, thinking, oh, crikey, we could, oh, fine, what the hell's going to happen here? Today on the Freedom Pack podcast, I am joined by Paul Hughes. Now, Paul has one of the craziest stories I've ever heard. And he just so happens to be from the same town as me, yet I've never heard of this story before. I feel like I should have been taught this in school. Um, But there's a very good reason why I wouldn't have heard the story. So I'm going to ask you, Paul, to explain to everyone here today um, the best you can, in a nutshell, what your career looked like and looks like so far. Oh, I'm ex Royal Air Force. Um, I speak Russian, Arabic, and Pashto. I'm also a qualified forensic engineer and a weapons inspector who's looked for weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East, predominantly Iraq. And um, I've come face to face with some rather notorious and famous people, but you never heard of me. And there's a valid reason for that is that uh, you keep yourself hush hush. And when I was operational, I did 23 years in the UK military doing military operations, um, which were classified. So you don't tell. It's a need to know principle, basically. So even members of my family didn't really understand what I was doing. My kids, I've got four kids. Only now, when they're starting to watch some podcasts, and I'm all, I'm a ground hunter on Channel 4's Hunted and Celebrity Hunted as well, and they're starting to put things together and realize that yeah dad didn't quite have an office job type thing you were doing all weird and wacky things around the globe so uh yeah that's kind of me but i've been out the military now i left in 2012 i did 23 years service uh, i've been working for myself since then as a forensic engineer so and doing counter-terror work so i advise on security situations um <laughs> in weird and wacky parts of the world, you name it. I've done it from the back of a super yacht in the Mediterranean to prisons in different parts of Europe, advising how to counter drone attacks, etc., or logistical deliveries of various things into sort of those establishments and how to counter it. So uh, then all that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's it. So it is quite difficult to explain, I must admit. So in terms of the intelligence space, I've spoken to one other guest so far um, from the USA, Andrew Bustamante. He is was a CIA spy. And when I spoke to, to Andrew, he told me that his journey to becoming a CIA spy wasn't something that he planned for. It wasn't something that you can make inroads in. It's not that type of career. It's almost the type of career you just fall into at the right place at the right time. I wonder for you, was your experience similar or was that something you always wanted to do? No, I just, I joined because I joined relatively late. I was 20 when I joined the, the Royal Air Force. And um, uh, up until that point, I failed my A-levels in school. Uh, didn't do well, uh, reasons various. And um, ended up selling suits in Top Man in Cardiff, which I absolutely loved because from a Ponty boy to moving to working in Cardiff, you know, the big metropolis and working with people from different backgrounds, colors and creeds and all sorts of religions and uh, sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera. You, you are in a city, you know, and really, and I really enjoyed my time working in Cardiff, but, and I learned the, I had the gift of the gab, really. I, I had some great guys I was working with who had plenty of experience. And when you can suddenly sell suits to any guy coming through the door and you can sort of look at them, size them up and realize where they're coming from, what they want that suit for, 
and sort of chatting to them, then you just break down the barriers. And that came so useful in the military, certainly when you're breaking down barriers, when you're trying to win over somebody from a different nation, from a different background, who speaks mm. a different language, has a different religion, has different ideologies. And they see and they begin to trust you. So it's, a, it's an element of trust. But going directly into sort of the spying world, so to speak, there's not just, you know, there's there's three main uh, intelligence agencies in the UK. There's GCHQ, Government Communications Headquarters. There's MI5 and there's MI6. MI5 is home security. MI6 is international stuff. So the MI6 is the James Bond type characters, really, or they <laughs> allude to be. Um, but you have a mixture of all that. And in the military, you can specialize in different areas as well. I spent my initial... Uh, target language was Russian when I joined the military the Cold War was was ebbing uh, towards sort of everybody getting on so it wasn't really there and it's come back with a vengeance now as we see on the news but ultimately then I did two years uh, working with my Russian language and then I was selected to be one of the first uh, my course was the first that was allowed in the Royal Air Force to go on Arabic interpretership so uh, pre previously to that, it was an army domain and it was Royal Signals or Royal Intelligence personnel that uh, offered those courses. And they had to go in and do a basic course, then go on to an interpretership, which is, you know, a higher qualification still. Well, we got thrown in at the deep end to the interpretership interpretership level which is uh 18 months of just pure language learning small class sizes but you get immersed in it and you learn not just fussa which is classical arabic but you learn dialects then from certain other countries whether it be north africa into the gulf down sort of into other central parts of asia that might have an arabic inkling as well really um so it's uh, it's quite full-on and then i did that for many years and then 9 11 happened 2001 and I was whisked away then because of my language prowess to go and learn Pashto which is one of the languages in Afghanistan there's predominantly two languages there's Pashto and Dari Dari is Persian based which is Iranian and uh, Pashto is pretty much the main language and it's the language that the Taliban were using as their main lingua franca basically for communicating uh, their ideals so I had to learn that pretty much within three months so that's reading writing and speaking it and then off out to those uh neck of the woods and to hunt and find fingers crossed osama bin laden so uh yeah so you don't aim to become that you sort of go into the intelligence sphere and then opportunities come up and you find your forte and then if you're good at what you're doing and people notice it then kind of get approached really and you sort of you get offered certain uh, positions and work and they try you out so uh, that's exactly what happened to me so the languages thing is something that i find extremely compelling because i've heard you mention before you were spotted as having an aptitude for being able to learn languages quite quickly that's really interesting because you mentioned you you failed your GCSEs. You said you were no good in school. What is it then about your brain that makes you able to learn these languages so quickly? Where does that aptitude come from? Because these aren't just simple languages. These are complex languages. We're talking Russian, Arabic, and Pashto, and you learned them in such a short space of time under so much time pressure. I'm in my own experience, and I'm sure I can speak for most people here when I say it would almost take us a lifetime to master a second language, let alone another three. It's well, I'm a, I'm a fellow at the Chartered Institute of Linguists in London now and have wow. been for many years, which is an elected position. So, and I go down there on a routine basis and I give keynote talks to the annual general meeting and I, I actually lecture in. Uh, various universities so I've been to University of Cambridge to various colleges there and wow. Oxford and uh, other uh, really you know nice establishments that when I was growing up in Ponty like uh, none of my family went to university and um, all from a working class background you know, predominantly from mining background and uh, what I found is that in school school didn't fit me uh, primary school did I really love primary school and you can think big, can't you, in primary yeah. school? You can sort of, 
you know, people ask you where you want to be. And I remember uh, sort of really wanted to be an astronaut. I was fascinated by planets and rockets and sort of planes in general. Uh, and uh, I re- I might, you know, my parents and my grandparents bought me books on the planets and on rockets and NASA and stuff like that. And I really, really read them from cover to back and would draw pictures of them and really sort of, you know, you fantasize into that world when you're a little kid and you're thinking, yeah, I can do this, I can do this. And then all of a sudden, what I found when I went to secondary school, the, the secondary school I went to, it was god awful. You know, by modern standards today, it, it was appalling. It really was. It would have failed Ofsted routinely. Um, <laughs> the bullying was rife. It wasn't cool to be clever, um, and you had to play the grey man, which ultimately helped me in the long run, I suppose, because I learned to play the grey man and to blend in and how to humour. Uh, the idiots so to speak to avoid getting bullied and uh, so and but the way they teach languages in school I feel is the wrong way Um, you need to start and get 0 to 60 as quick as you can and the way to excite that is to speak it speak it speak it speak it speak it converse it because you learn the vocabulary better that way and you remember it that way there's a now I'm ex- I've got a master's in cognitive science now, right? Which is wow. basically brain science and how we apply ourselves. That's why I've done the elite sport type stuff for various athletes. And, you know, I'm doing, I, I still work with rugby players, footballers, uh, extreme sports athletes, such as wings. I got uh, Liam Byrne who's the uh, British wingsuit champion. I work with Liam now and it's brilliant, but it's from what I've learned from my career going through the military to where I am now, but also the masters that I've learned as well about how the brain works. It all makes sense because I can use myself as a living case study. And I can see that how I struggled in school and that if I opened up my head now, right? Now, unfortunately in my forensic line of work, I see dead people, not wanting to sound like Bruce Willis in Sixth Sense, but that's exactly what it is. So you take the top of a head off and you pull out a brain. It's in a water-filled sack. You slip that sack, you're left with a big gray walnut. That's your gray matter. That is your hard drive, right? And it's a default. It's like getting a new Apple Mac out of the box and pressing on, woof, it lights up and it'll work. But it can't communicate with other lobes in the brain very efficiently until you get the broadband in your head. Now, that broadband is called white matter and it grows. Obviously, you're born with some of it in your head, but it really grows like wildfire, like a mesh through the different parts and spheres of the brain, connecting different parts of your brain up when you're a toddler because you're starting to move around and your brain is trying to protect you from danger that's out there. And then it also accelerates around about you when you're a pubescent really you know you start sprouting hair in funny parts of your body and you get lumps and bumps here there and everywhere that's when it really accelerates as well but you never lose it you always have that ability to grow white matter and that's the white matter you need to learn languages because language learning as well as playing a musical instrument are the catalysts for white matter now that's the epiphany that I had, right? When I was on my Russian course, when I first joined the military, and I'd just done my square bashing bits and bobs at the Royal Air Force, and I went on to a place in Rutland, RAF North Luffenham, as it was, and on my Russian course, and I struggled because in this 10-man room that I was in, this barrack block, so I'm there with nine other guys, who are, some are on a course with me, some are a course behind me, or they're moving around, yeah? So there's every few months there's a new course coming through, and as it was at that time. And these guys had come from college and university and stuff, and they had a lot of white matter going on. They could already speak other languages to a decent level, whereas I'd done the old GCE system, which is the older GCSE system before the, that sort of came in. And uh, all I could ask really for is flipping. I could ask for a kilo of apples and where's the tourist information office. That's about it. So there wasn't a lot of white matter going on. I was really having that. I had that foggy brain sort of syndrome all the time. And all of a sudden, when I was learning my Rus- on my Russian course, I failed two progress tests on the bounce. And if you fail three, you're under review and you get recourse back several months. And then I thought, oh, I'm having a mare here. Really, I'm struggling. So one of my instructors is a Russian guy, bless him, he's no longer on this planet, but he'd been a sneaky beaky kind of spy type person who came across to the West, if you know what I mean. Mm. And uh, he was a brilliant, brilliant, very clever guy, very funny. And he said, my name is Paul, so the Russian for Paul is Pavel. He goes, oh, Pavel, you're having a problem with your uh, vocabulary. 
<laughs> Funny old thing, Sherlock. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of guessed that. And he said, uh, "I think you're dyslexic." And I was like, yeah, "What?" He was dyslexic. You dis you dyslexia. He said, uh, "Do the words on the page jiggle?" And I went, "Well, yeah, they do on some books. That's, I, I'm not a fan of reading. No, I can read, but you know, I learned to read and write when I was very, very young. You know, before I even started." sort of infant school really and my mum said I was up and running reading and writing and whatnot so it's the first time anybody said anything and I thought oh, I might have a point here he goes uh for you he said um try flash cards you know if my accent sounds like a mere cat it is because I know Russian basically so I do sound <laughs> like an advert on the telly when I do my Russian voice but um uh, so that's what I did because up until that point we were getting a four sheets of paper in a you know in a binder every day with vocabulary on and you had to learn these words every day and at the end of the week you'd have a progress test at the end of the month you'd have an even bigger test and i'd be there all night i come back from the mess hall at i don't know half five six o'clock and i'd be there till nine o'clock every night sat on my bed trying to memorize these like two sheets of paper and by bedtime i was every rest of the guys had maybe gone out for a pint gone to the gym uh, and everything else and I'm still sat on the bed cramming like crazy which is the worst thing you can do because when you cram for stuff you're not shoving it into your long-term memory I know that know this it's scientifically proven I've done it myself you're ramming it into your short-term memory so what you're doing you're learning a shopping list it's like me saying to you now oh, you know tell you what you could do can you pop down the corner shop go to the local co-op get me and uh, you know get me six brown rolls get me a chunk a chunk of cheese get me some of that, that nice cheddar and get me this that and the other and some pringles and go get me a, i mean diet coke and get me this that and the other so you're shoving it in your short-term memory when it comes to the following morning and i'm going over the vocab I'm, it's kind of there but it's vague and i've got to get it refreshed in my head and then by the time the test comes around i've learned those words in a shopping list from the start to the big to the end you know so right yeah. way through this list of course the instructor in the lesson doesn't go down the list like that goes random so start at the back then go to the front then go to the middle so that's completely blows your short-term memory the smithereens so what i did was the flashcards and i learned how to do it myself so we had a good section or the reprographic section on the base which is useful i went there and said look guys can you get me some make me several hundred flashcards you know i'll get you a beer later on you know and they were like yeah no problem so i got all these blank flashcards made up and i'd write down five at a time no more than five and go through them and this is my method that then worked for me so i used to go down and sit in the church on the base which is quiet at night obviously the padre left the door open and i just go down there and fair play you had a coffee machine and you could have a coffee decent coffee and i could go through the words at peace and quiet and five words at a time. So you learn those five words, put them to one side. Do another pack of five, learn them. When you've got those two packs of five and you're going through them without any mistakes, shuffle them together, you've got one pack of 10. Now that then tells your brain they're not in order anymore. They're random. So therefore your, your long-term memory kicks in straight away. So as if by magic, your brain will work it out. There's a thing in your brain called the hippocampus. It's the ringmaster for learning. And it does it all for you. It's like having chat GPT in your head. That's exactly what it is. It'll work it out. Go, oh, yeah, I get it. That's the algorithm for that. Boom. And in you go. So all of a sudden, I found myself that these flashcards would just grow and grow and grow. And then when I made these flashcards, I got to go for a walk anywhere. And we had this big lake alongside, which is about 20 odd miles around called Rutland Water. And I used to go down there and just nice summer's evening or whatever, just walk around. And what I've walked through, not all of it, it's 20 odd miles, but it would take me a good many hours. But you do for, go for a good half an hour, hour stretch, and then come back. Nice pub on the side, something to eat, a bit of a drink, come back, job done. That's how it lit up. And I find that um, some of the words were uh, quite hard, some were quite similar, um, you know, and uh, to English words, and some words transfer across. So, like the Russian word for bodybuilding is bodybuilding, you know, it's that type of stuff or exhaust, mm. exhaust. So, it, it's it, it, some things are quite similar, then some are quite difficult. So, um, you got to get your senses involved then. So, what I now know is that when you verbalize the word, so don't just read it on a flashcard, you actually say it out loud. So you look as if you're talking to yourself and look a bit mad, but it doesn't matter because your senses pick up on that. Because when you say the word out loud, 
not only is your, your visionary cortex looking at it, your eyes are seeing it, your auditory cortex, you're hearing it because you're speaking it as well. And then you've got to imagine things. So I used to imagine sights and sounds and smells of something in a souk, like a market in the Middle East and different colours and things positioned. And you use your imagination because you never fill your brain. You can't fill your brain. And when you have these linkages in, and then uh, for some words that are difficult, like the Russian word for good is khorosho. Khorosho sounds like a khorosho. So what I've done when I'm doing talks in school and stuff, I shout that bit out and the entire hall just jumps in the air. And they, yeah, but what's the Russian word for good? Oh, yeah, it sounds like khorosho, khorosho, boom. Welcome to linguists. You know, we're all linguists. We all speak a language of some sort. It's just knowing how to learn it. It's just our mother tongue. We're brought up listening to it, speaking it, in drips and drabs from a very young age. And in the class sizes we have in school, there's 30 odd people who ultimately, some of them don't want to learn a language, don't see the relevance of learning a language. They don't under, un, understand that that white matter, that super fast broadband that you're putting in your head helps for everything else in life. So it's not just there, once that broadband's in, it's not just for the language learning, it's for everything. It's so any new learning you're doing. When you're playing sports, you will spot things quicker because your brain is wired quicker now. You have got a situational awareness about you, which is par excellence. Okay, bit of French there. There you go, eh? But it's sort of, uh, so yeah, that's it, wow. mate. It's it's It sounds complex, but it's not. When you break it down, it's, and you've just got to be persistent with it and it'll come and it will definitely come. Man, that is that is so so inspiring because you were quite clearly a very very intelligent man, and you you have a fantastic brain, a fantastic mind. But it just, as you mentioned, it just did not connect with you in school. You were you weren't built for exams. You were no good at traditional school lessons. It reminds me of that old saying that. You know, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, then you're always going to just assume that it's useless and stupid. At that time, when uh, Baz, that was the, the Russian guy, he said, you know, I think you're dyslexic. I didn't even occur to me. And I didn't really think of it again because I did well on my Russian course. And I thought, didn't really occur. And then uh, one of my kids, uh, when uh, she went up to secondary school, she's a bright girl, but was having trouble. I was really getting her down. And I got a privately screen for dyslexia because it was, I wouldn't say it's trendy, but a few people had had it and went and said, oh yeah, and you get an extra time in your math, in your lessons for exams and things like that. And and I noticed that when she was writing, she'd do the D's and B's and P's and things wrong way around. And I remember doing that when I first learned to write. And I thought, oh, there might be something in this. Let's go private, you know, pay a few quid, wasn't that much. And it happened to be not far from where we were living. So we went in and we saw this mad professor and um, she was good as gold. And she, I was telling her how my daughter was feeling, my daughter was describing things and they went, yeah, here's the test. And they did this test. And I was describing what I did in school as well. And this professor went, well, you could take the test as well. I went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She goes, no, no, two for the price of one. Do it. Go on, go ahead, do it. So I did it. Well, yeah, my daughter was dyslexic. Came back, yeah, you're dyslexic. She was with you. I thought, oh, here we go. Not dyslexic, just a bit stupid. And um, <clears throat> I was off the scale. She went, wow. you are hyper dyslexic. She said, I, I, what do you do for a job? And I said, oh, I'm in the Royal Air Force, I'm air crew. Um, can't really tell you what I do, but I speak a few languages and everything else. She went, that's it. You've got workarounds. Hell's a workaround. She says, your brain <clears throat> has rewired itself completely. She said, because you don't work as a regular person does. You are working on a different speed. She said, um, you sit still. Because she said I was a bit fidgety. You probably see I'm moving around in his chair now this evening. And uh, I went, yeah, I do. She goes, well, what goes hand in glove with this is also attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I mean, ADHD, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got that. She went, well, I can't judge that. She said, I, I can tell you you've got dyslexia. She said, but on an ADHD front, she said, it's not a pejorative thing. She said, and people think it is. She said, imagine the whole world as a village. And she said, you need people um, who can obviously multitask. They're normally the women 
because the men of the hunter gatherers and go out you need people to be hyper vigilant and on guard people are can trap can cook can fight and do all this sort of thing she said you are a hyper vigilant person that can do a multitude of things and you're always looking for the next thing all right yeah that sums it up and i so i called my mom uh back in ponty you know i called her and i went do you, do you think I've got ADHD? She goes, oh, God, yes, yeah, she said. You, you never slept. You were always on the go. She said you literally, you could get by on next to no sleep, and you'd always want to do something, and you start something, you do it for a few minutes, and then go on to the next something, on the next something, and you'd create, you were always doing stuff. And I was thinking back, and I thought, crikey, in junior school, right, I used to finish my work really, really quick. And because I was bored then, I came up with all these different ideas. So I set up the school newspaper, this is before IT came out in classes. Yeah, this is like L5. This is like late 1970s, early 1980s, right? So, yeah, late 70s. And uh, so you stuff, the teacher went, Yeah, fill your boots. So, who, who, who are going to be the editor in chief? Are you going to have any other kids you're going to select? And they said, What you can do, you can publish it at the end of the week. We'll get um, the school secretary to photocopy it and it can go out to, you know, the kids take home to mums and dads. But what we're doing in our class. I thought, okay, so that's what I did. So I finished my lesson quick and I got on the newspaper with felt it pens and all the rest of it and had a few other people in the class then who would finish, would do other things. I'd have a sports report, I'd have flipping somebody doing a crossword that would design it or do a maze or something daft, you know, just to just fill time. And um, and also in wet play, you know, uh, <laughs> in the Ronda Valley, we got a bit of wet play. And um, so if we weren't allowed out playing with a rugby ball or running around and, you know, doing God knows what on the playground, um, the head teacher, or deputy head teacher, I think he was, he was playing chess and he realised that I could play chess. He used to play me in chess. And I said, why don't we have a chess club? So I set up the school chess club. So it's all really entrepreneur, well, entrepreneurial, I should say, because you're inside school. It's not doing it for your own benefit, like. And, uh, and it all occurred to me that I thought, flipping else, you staring me in the face. I'm I'm hyper hmm. and so I'm dyslexic and I'm ADHD and what's really really funny is in the military then and certainly within the special forces fraternity because I've worked closely with those guys um so you're talking predominantly SAS and uh I know Billy Billingham really really well Des Powell who's at SAS Bravo 30 best-selling book um best-selling author Damian Lewis <laughs> we can all talk at a thousand mile an hour and have a million ideas in a matter of seconds, you know, it's just there all the time. And then we were chatting one night, and it was Billy, I was on tour, and we were all came, we all came to the conclusion that yeah, we're we're all a little bit on the ADHD sort of spectrum here. <laughs> we're all we've all educationally massively underachieved. Granted, I've now caught up. I've got several master's degrees at distinction level. You know, I'm not want to sound like a big know-it-all, but I got I got the bug for education late and i realized that i really enjoy it and i wasn't going for like a dastardly amatly how many flipping medals can i get on the education side of things it was because i actually enjoy it and i lit the touch paper in my head and it's like the same for these guys as well they've been switched on people yeah. really really smart really situational awareness is just on it on point all the time and very aware of everything around them and the world and how they fit in it and how they can make a difference and I thought, what all this? We we, yeah, there's a brethren here. And it, it, so it's a thing to be ashamed of. And when I do a lot of school talks now, I've spoken to millions of students up around the country. I started off when I, I was talking to some naughty boys in the school who wouldn't behave in a French lesson. And the veil of secrecy got lifted off um, uh, the guys I was working with in the military at the time. We could actually say that we spoke these languages, so Russian, Arabic, Pashto, the fact that I was I had forensic qualifications, weapons inspector, blah, blah, blah. And of course, I felt a day I wasn't instructing or flying or whatever, um, I, I was allowed to go and do it like an outreach thing for the Royal Air Force and go into these schools, which were predominantly inner city schools uh, with multicultural backgrounds, uh, rough, and um, I won them over. And I still do today. So it's one of the things that I do on a routine basis is to get into a school. If you can talk to several hundred uh, sort of GCSE students and keep them quiet, have a meeting up the palm of your hand, metaphorically speaking, and wanting to be the best version of themselves they can be, because ultimately we get one life as far as we know. Don't waste it just existing. You've got to live. 
So if you're quite happy to sit at night and do sweet sod all really and not better yourself, then you're a fool. You need to be the best version of yourself you can be. And when you're the best version of yourself you can be, then you act like a magnet and people notice you. When you start becoming world class, you start breaking through and people start contacting you, you know, and all of a sudden these doors start opening and these opportunities start happening. You know, so, uh, yeah, so it's a uh, languages light up the brain and then everything else. Once that broadband's in place, boof, go wherever your heart wants to take you. And we do start dreaming big like you did in primary school. I'm not mm. saying you can get the NASA and be an astronaut. But if you don't aim for the planets, aim for the planets, you land on a cloud. It's, it's the language stuff with your story that I find the most compelling. Arabic. And Russian, those are two languages I'm sure everyone are familiar with. They've probably heard before. But Pashto is a language that most people wouldn't have heard about. But if you Googled it, you'd quickly realize why someone like you would need that language. So to spare everyone the time of going to Google, what is Pashto and why did you need to use it? Pashto is predominantly spoken in Afghanistan. It is the main language in Afghanistan, of which there are there are several languages, but the main two are Pashto and Dari. <clears throat> Pashto is the main official language of Afghanistan. And it's uh, when my boss put me on a Pashto course, it was six of us from the UK after 9-11. We got selected straight away. Um, the six of us could speak Arabic or Persian, which is Farsi. Iranian, for want of a better word, and uh, we're from different backgrounds, from different agencies, shall we say, in the UK. And um, our boss was a pilot, and uh, I love pilots, you know, um, uh, talented guys and girls and all the rest of it, but uh, how can I say, they're, they're not in the intelligence sphere, really, from a linguistic <laughs> perspective. So when they say, oh, it's, a, it's like Arabic, and I thought, mm, if it was like Arabic, I would have known this like Arabic. I've heard of Pashto and I've heard of Dari. I knew that it was a language in Afghanistan and that area, a sort of Pakistan border and Baluchistan and things like that is spoken. So I had a vague, because I had an interest in Taliban and uh, the, when the Soviet Union was in there in the 80s, I used to, when I was prepping to join the Royal Air Force, I used to read the Daily Telegraph because when you go through the selection process, you have to be worldly aware of what's going on in the world. I got really into sort of the Taliban as it was and their various alliances that were there, the Mujahideen, which were formed uh, to fight the Soviet Union, sort of to push them out, which they did. Um, so I knew quite a bit about it, so quite a bit, quite a bit, but I didn't know about the language structure. I didn't know how many letters were in the alphabet. I didn't know about the grammar. All I had was my boss, the pilot, saying, yeah, it's just like Arabic, you'll be fine. He didn't have a clue. I think he just sort of, sort of threw it away, going, yeah, don't worry about it, guys. Get stuck in. You can, you're good guys. I think that's what he meant. But it sort mm -hmm. of, um, uh, it wasn't until you got there. And I was like, first day, and our instructor, brilliant guy, um, he's a doctor, qualified doctor, young doctor, um, who was in the Taliban. Oh. And you're like, you are kidding me. And he goes, no, I was forced into it. He said, I was working in the hospital in Kabul. And he said, I had my family, uh, mum and dad, and uh, siblings at a farm. And uh, they had vineyards, believe it or not. And they grew grapes, not from the wine, but for the grapes itself. And, you know, prunes and God knows what else. And, uh, and uh, all sorts of other bits and bobs fruit-wise. And um, the, the Taliban came onto his land uh, and uh, basically squatted. And... Pashtuns are very open and very warm and welcoming people. And because there's no service stations or travel lodges and premier inns and God knows what along routes, they offer, if you knock on somebody's door, you know, on a main highway type thing, just the arid highway, they'll give you a bed for the night and they'll give you some bread and they'll give you, they'll feed you, walk you. And it's the Pashtun way. It's, 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 mind-blowing when you're there you know and you see it and you see it actually happening and these guys came onto their land didn't bloody leave did they they stayed there all the time so and uh, then they realized that uh, the, uh ahmed was um, 
a qualified doctor because he was off the hospital every day. We'd come back with his doctor's bag, stethoscope, doctor's bits and bobs like. And um, they said, right, you're now our doctor. So it's, you can't really argue with them because you're going to meet your fate, you know. So uh, that's what he did for a couple of years. But he wanted to get out. He wanted to practice medicine in the West. Then he managed to get out via the Red Crescent, which is like the Red Cross, but for Central Asia. Came to the UK. Uh, our security apparatus realized he was coming in, uh, realized that he spoke several languages fluently and his English was impeccable um and uh he was our instructor so he had no real teaching experience of languages as such but he gave us such an insight he was brilliant and we, the books we had were quite old and he was teaching us street pashtu as well and also how the taliban and al-qaeda elements that he had seen there operated uh, what the mix was like if we interjected some Arabic words into our Pashtun sentences, would a Pashtun understand? So it was like a lingua franca, like a common language, if we got a bit stuck. And he was sort of telling us these different things of what would go on, what was going on. So uh yeah, it's um it, the Pashtu itself, it's it's a hard language. Yeah, I found because we only had three months to learn it. So you're literally you're starting from nothing. It was nothing like Arabic. OK, so the wording, the grammar, the conjugations of verbs and things like that, completely different. And uh, it sounds different as well. There's a certain more, there's a Central Asian sort of twang to it. You can even hear a little bit of a Pakistani, even Indian, Indian subcontinent sort of twang to it. If I say my name is Paul, it's Zamanam Pordi. So you sound, I'm not mm. taking the mic when I'm doing that. That is the dialect when it comes out type of things, which is different to my normal inflection, yeah? So um, it, it's completely different. It was hard to get it done in three months, but we did it. And obviously working in Central Asia then, and I, I've done it in the military and I've done it since leaving the military as well, back and forth doing all sorts of security, uh, whether it be sort of counter-terror advice and things like that in Kabul and various other parts. Um, it sort of, uh, it worked. So it's still in my head today. So it's living proof that once that white matter is there, that broadband is there. And you get like a muscle memory really from it as well. It's like my Russian is, I was taught Russian to be passive. So my initial job when I qualified as a baby spook for want of a better word, was to be listening to Russian communications. So I wasn't going to be behind uh, in East Berlin talking to Russians, et cetera, et cetera, or doing agent handling, which we call as human intelligence, human, nothing like that. Mine was, the job was predominantly signals intelligence. So you're passive. But um, my passive understanding of Russian now, I can speak it, I can get by, certainly no problem, but my passive understanding is still there. So you recognize that if I'm listening to something on the telly, which is in Russian, I'll get large chunks of it. I'll get the meaning of it. And then all of a sudden the brain kicks in and goes, oh, yeah, you want It's like as if you put it in an archive and it brings it forward again. And I'd be lying in bed at night or something or driving my car or walking my dogs or whatever. And all of a sudden the bits and bobs start coming back again. So once you start practicing, it does come back. It is dormant, but it will come back to the, to the active parts of the brain that are utilizing that part of the language. Okay, so once you learn Pashto, how did you end up in the same room as Saddam Hussein? And am I right in thinking you had to pretend to be Swedish just to get in that room? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when I was doing the Dodge Woodall event for Lives podcast, it was funny because Dodge was in hysterics over this. But uh, yeah, I was aware. I, I guess seconded um, when Saddam Hussein was in power, obviously he invaded Kuwait. Um, uh, and then he did it again, and we had what we called Optelic, uh, which started, let me think, that was, that was 2003. And uh, so obviously there was large coalition forces, predominantly led by America, but we had a you know, rather substantial contingent there as well. And um, But prior to that, uh, Saddam had a lot of sanctions from the United Nations on Iraq. Uh, he wasn't allowed to fly any aircraft above the 33rd or below the 33rd parallel or above the 36th parallel. So he couldn't, uh, so if Western forces were flying missions, 
monitoring what was going on in Iraq. He wasn't really allowed to respond to them or be threatening or do anything that could harm the Kurdish population in northern Iraq or the Shia population in southern Iraq in the marshlands um, because they had previous instances of him doing criminal activity there, basically, you know, and really harming those populations of different nations, really. You know, the Kurds are a separate entity. They're not Arab, they're Kurd. And the Shia population are Arab, but uh, Saddam and the ruling Ba'ath party is a Sunni Muslim. And he really didn't like Shia that much because he had an eight-year war with Iran in the 1980s. Iran is predominantly Shia Muslim. So there's a lot of sort of religious ideology behind all that type of stuff as well. But I was seconded into the United Nations Special Commission, UNSCOM is the abbreviation for it, as it was then. Uh, and that was 97 and 98. And uh, we had my first operation in there. We flew, we had a, a UN safe house. Our main building was in Bahrain. And then we'd fly in to Baghdad or the air base just south of Baghdad. And um, uh, on on their Hercules flight in. So we had a United Nations or white Hercules with UN on the side, which was uh, private, wasn't military. It was a private Hercules flown in. Um, and as we were flying in, it's noisy on the back of a Herc, you know, headphones on, but we had little microphones on. We were discussing because we all came together. It was different teams that were flying in. And there was three Terps, interpreters, so Terp for short, so the slang we use for it. And uh, one of the guys was uh, from Lebanon. One of the other guys was from Tunisia. So they're both Arabs. So they're native speaking Arabs. OK, and I was coming in as another Turk. But I'm the British guy who's also a Turk. And uh, as we were at the airport in Bahrain, ready to take off, it came through that Saddam had banned American and British UN personnel from being in Iraq. There was a bit of a political standoff over access to his palaces, et cetera, et cetera. And we thought, well, we're on the aircraft now. But <laughs> we had a bit of an epiphany a few days prior to that. And one of my American colleagues was born in Mexico, so his place of birth was Mexico. But he was subsequently an American citizen. So on our UN passports, he put Mexico. <laughs> and I'm born, I'm a Welshman, so I've got Wales. So it said Wales, it didn't say UK, it says Wales. So we just thought, well, the worst thing that can happen is say you get back on the aircraft, we fly back to Bahrain straight away. They go, you're not coming in and get lost. So we tried our luck. And as we landed at this airbase, it's called Habania, it's a big airbase, it's massive. And we landed there and they had this security uh, customs guys there and you're getting off. But we had already agreed that I wasn't going to speak any Arabic because I don't look as if I know the language. And I agreed that I would be known as Dr. Paul and uh, that I was a specialist. Uh, I was a gastroenterologist. And uh, you do a bit of medical stuff when you're in the military and everything else. So I had a very Wikipedia understanding of physiological sort of stuff. Yeah, I could do medic stuff and all the rest of it, but I was nowhere near a doctor. We thought we'll chance it and see what happens because the, the, the overall guy in charge of Enscom said to me, he said, they won't expect you to understand what's going on. So just stay passive and see what's going on and listen and see what they're planning. So anyway, we landed on this base, went to the customs place, and we were one of the first to be seen And we're in this long queue and they were just stamping the passport, looking up at you, say something in you know, very simple English shouting at you really, stamp the passport and in you go. And they're quite, they're quite intimidating. And uh, this guy looks at me and we got the unscum polo shirt on. And I had, uh, you can either have a baseball cap, a blue United Nations baseball cap, or you can have like a floppy cowboy hat type style that you could pull up, a bit like Crocodile Dundee type stuff, yeah? And I had a blue one of them, but mine was sort of floppy down. So I looked like a bit of a cowboy. And this guy looked at me as I, you can see his complete disdain for me. And he went, Wales. And I went, yeah. He went, Wayne, Wayne Wales, which is where's Wales? I went, Wales. He goes, Wales, Wales. I went, Sweden. And he went, oh, stamp the passport. And I went. <laughs> so obviously being six foot four and blonde helped and everything else and looking a bit 
whimsical in my floppy hat type thing. I don't know. But um, yeah, so in I got. So we were literally in, um, and we were in Baghdad and the operation. So we started doing our stuff the following day. And immediately it was apparent that they didn't expect me to understand Arabic. And so we had uh, we had minders that were with us wherever we went. And we're called MD, which stands for National Mon National Monetary Directorate. And they were not, they were uh, Bath Party aficionados, so Saddam henchmen basically, but they're from uh, Republican Guard, which is his hardcore of soldiers, really, his elite mm -hmm. core of soldiers. And they were, you know, they were they were mean people. They gave off that air. They could tell that, you know, they were nails. And um, but they were chatting around and quite happily discussing organizing demonstrations, getting students involved, move that here, do this there. And they were trying to find out where we were going days in advance and trying to talk to us or trying to put different devices to find things on us and all sorts of things. So so it was quite funny, but uh, oh, oh, it, it, I think they got a bit like, well, how the hell do they know? Uh, they must have thought they had a mole in them amongst their own group or not. I don't know. It was just me. They were just chatting around me like crazy. And I obviously, I can do a real good thick look quite easy, you know, and I look as if I'm not even paying attention, you know, sit there, scratch my ass or flip and do whatever. And uh, they just started talking around me. So that helped massively. And it wasn't, uh, I eventually got found out, but it was a few months after you know and um oh. the, so that that was that was different man that that is such uh, just a crazy story now i viewed you in the past and i appreciate the uh metaphor here because i'm a big fan of harry potter but i've heard you describe saddam hussein's aura as being similar to the dementors in harry potter if you could even begin to describe it how would you describe the aura of Saddam Hussein? On that was on that first day. So we literally got through. We were chuckling that we were in Baghdad. And uh, we got through the customs type of thing. So myself and the American colleague that I had with me. Uh, and we went to our headquarters, which is um, it's called the Canal Hotel, because uh, it was the Canal Hotel. And it had been sort of commandeered by the United Nations. So it was half UNSCOM and half UNICEF. And we got there, we dumped our bags off, et cetera, et cetera. And then we were just grabbing some quick scrans, some quick scoff, you know, food down our neck and everything else and getting some water on board. And uh, the message came through, you need to get across to like their equivalent of the home office, which is just across the uh, Tigris River. And um, so we got there, we went across, and there's quite a few of us went across. It was, uh, must have been about dozen jeeps went across so we all had like land cruisers or uh, nissan patrols and jeep cherokee that type of stuff and we all went across and it was just there was a few there was two new teams that came in and there was other teams that were there so there's about 50 of us in total and we're in this big auditorium type thing and it, it's quite imposing when you go into these buildings because they're ornate um and it's big you know, oil paintings of Saddam Hussein everywhere, uh, big gold pillars and all sorts of stuff. And we got filed in and his, you know, the Republican Guard guys are there as well. So, and they don't look half assed They are pucker soldiers, these guys, right? They are, you know, very skilled. And um, we went into this auditorium, sat down, and the word went round because we had um, the head inspector with us, a Russian guy, uh, a Russian guy. We had a, a guy called Richard Butler. Um, who had previously the week before been speaking to the Russian foreign secretary who had been in Baghdad and all sorts of stuff. So he was a big player and you'd see him routinely on the news, on BBC, CNN, that type of stuff. So it's really funny meeting him for the first time. So he was in the front row and other guys and I was towards the back. So I could see everybody else's reaction as well. And the whisper went round that the, the, the Iraqi foreign secretary was coming up, foreign minister, called a guy called Tariq Aziz. Um, which I was intrigued to see because he speaks really, really brilliant English and he's a Christian. He's not a Muslim. So he's a Masihi, as they call it in Arabic. He's a, he's a, you know, which comes from Messiah, obviously the word. So Masihi is Christian. So I was intrigued to see him. And then all of a sudden you could just feel the atmosphere changing and you could see the guards really putting to attention, tensing up and all the rest of it. And it was just a, 
you can feel like a cold in the room. And then Saddam walks in, and it is Saddam. And we were told about doppelgangers and all sorts of stuff. Um, flipping on, mate. I've never, sh- I was never been so scared in my life. You could feel it, and your hairs were just standing on the. I could physically see the hairs on the guys in front of me. And we had some tough cookies with us, right? You know, and it was like flipping, Nora, right, this is surreal. And Saddam came in and he had an interpreter alongside, he had Turk Aziz as well. And they just held a press conference basically and bollocked the UN. And he was giving it large, you know, and we were just there going, flipping out for, oh my God, what if he now launches and realizes that there's Western, that there's two Westerners in the room as well, you know, who shouldn't be here. As he found out, and all of this is going through in the back of your mind, thinking, oh, crikey, we could, oh, fire, what the hell's going to happen here? But he left, and um, and that was it. But it was, and Harry Potter wasn't out then, but when you see Harry Potter and the Dementors whizzing around the room, it was that kind of, It. I've never, I've seen some yucky stuff around the globe, but I've never felt evil like that. And it really was intense. Man, I I am scared just listening to that story. I can't imagine what it must have been like for you t- to be in that situation. Now, when you're in a situation like that, where you're doing such a vitally important job, but you are faced with such an intimidating and sort of life-threatening situation, how do you continue to operate? Because you are a high performer, right? You're operating at the highest level of what you do at this point. How do you continue to operate at that high performer level under those circumstances? Do you sort of switch into just autopilot mode and this is what you've been trained for? Or are you suddenly conscious of every little move you're making or every little word you're saying? No, you're hyper alert. But, um it's it's kind of funny it is sort of what i tended to do before i went anywhere for any period of time like that is i'd always check in with my folks so if i went um i go and check in with mum and dad because ultimately <laughs> sounds a bit morbid but you the odds are with you that you're coming back but you never can tell can you you know so i, I had several kids at that time and um so it's a bit unusual when you tuck them in a bed at night and then you're off, and then you're catching a flight late at night or traveling down to maybe Bryce Norton. If you're flying out to Baghdad with the UN, you're, you're going out of a main normal, you're flying out on a main airline to somewhere and you're staging in the Middle East and then going into Bahrain and then we're flying you with the UN in. So it's a different route. But yeah, my parents and my family would say that I'd switch. They'd see a point where I'd be normal and then all of a sudden, just before I'm going, I'd have my Bergen's ready or whatever, so you different kit for different environments and all that type of stuff. And then that's it. And if my dad, my mum and dad took me to Bryce Norton once, and I was flying, I remember I was flying, I think I was flying back into Iraq at some point, and they took me to Bryce Norton, and they dropped me off, and there was a Gurkha, um, Gurkha regiment guys that were there that were flying out with me um, on the same aircraft. And um, literally, when I got out of the car, and it's these guys then, that I, you know, and I, I was in uniform as well then, and these guys are then snapping to attention and stuff like that, and I'm, you know, being respectful to those guys and talking to them and everything else and all the rest of you. And, and my dad would say, you can see the difference in you straight away. You, you know, you literally, you're on game mode now. And that's it. And you tend to do that. You don't really, you don't think about it. It's not a conscious thing. It's just happens. Um, and it's like a few of the guys I know are special forces guys who um, the main uh, SAS base is Hereford, obviously, for those who, who know about things like that. And uh, ultimately, it's no, it's not a kept secret. But some of the guys didn't live there, or if they, were, if they were on standby, they stayed on base. If they were doing like a kind of terror team type thing, but the guys then who lived away, um, a few hours away, uh, when they were stood down and they had their time off for whatever reasons and all the rest of it, they unwind on their journey home so when they get home the husband the father was home type thing so you're not steering over things so you've got you you got your game time and you've got your family time and it's like i say game 
it's your mission time really you know and you keep them separate and you try the best you can really it is difficult it is a, it is a juggling act you know and um but uh, yeah but when you're there looking back now it's surreal looking back um and coming up with memoirs and things like that which are one unclassified because i can say what i was and i can say where i've been to a certain extent because it's been captured whether it be i think when i was on the weapons inspection team i was splashed across cnn for a flipping week um because there was a lot of tension going on in baghdad they were expecting another sort of strike against saddam which ultimately came in a, a mini show of force from the west called desert fox and i was there at 24 hours before they launched the tomahawk missiles into baghdad so the building we saw saddam in got one through the roof you know so it's that type of stuff so it yeah sort of it's a it's a fine line to walk so looking back now it's it's surreal um, and I'm in the ripe old age of nearly 55, for God's sake. And you're looking back over the years and thinking, "Cranky, I, yeah, it was risky kind of stuff." But you were trained for it, and that's the thing about the British Armed Forces. We are trained to a very, very high level, and you train hard. And if you have to fight, you fight easy because you literally your training has put you into such different environments where you've got to be able. To, you have to cope. You have to have methodologies that you rely on and can default to so when it all goes to ratchet which nine times out of ten it does you've got a plan you've got a default layer that you know that you can rely on that is there your backup is always there you can you know you literally got to think about it and uh, and there's people have different sort of ways of dealing with the pressure and everything else but um yeah we're trained to a very very high level Man, I really, really appreciate uh, guys like you when you come on this podcast because the stories are one thing, but just the insight you bring is just on another level. Like I, I think back to maybe two years ago now, and it's funny actually because we had General Stanley McChrystal on this podcast who I believe was responsible for the capture of Saddam Hussein. I think he ordered the airstrike. I, I met the guy that got Saddam. So I know the guy who got him out, who pulled him out the hole. Yeah. And that was, a, that was a hard one because he evaded for quite a while, you know? So it's uh, uh, like a bit like Bin Laden, really. Bin Laden was sort of, he was hiding in plain sight, you know? So it's, uh, yeah. So again, I, I, I was fortunate um when i met barack obama uh i was doing some stuff in london and i was uh, i was invited to downing street there was uh, a handful of brits and americans that were brought to allowed to go to downing street and have a barbecue with a barack obama michelle obama david cameron and his wife sam and uh, there's all the great and the good there from civil service ministry of defense etc cetera, etc cetera. And we were there. So, of course, some of the SEAL team guys were there as well. Like, you know, so, uh, yeah, we had a good chat. Now, you you mentioned a lot of these guys like Mark, Billy Billingham. These, these are guys we've had on the podcast. And um, these special forces guys, they tend to write, in my opinion, the the sort of better personal development books. And so, man, with everything I've heard today and from your story you have to write a book. I have seriously considered it. And I've been involved. Like, um, I work very closely with Damien Lewis, the best-selling author. Yeah. Amazing guy. Amazing. Former war correspondent who has just done some amazing stuff around the globe. But, yeah, so SA, I did SAS Bravo, SAS Bravo 3.0. Um, true story. You know, everybody's heard of Andy McNabb and Chris Ryan and the SAS yeah. Bravo 2.0 mission. But a good friend of mine is Des Powell. Um, there was ex SAS Sergeant Major, and pre COVID, Des was up staying with me in the week on the weekend, and we were just sitting in the back garden and just chewing the fat and everything else. And and Des just came out and goes, so, Because you know, first Gulf War, he said, You hadn't done Arabic by then, had you? I went, No, nah, mate, no, nah, no, nah, I was on my Russian course then. He goes, Oh, right. I said, oh, Were you out there then for that? Were you? He goes, Oh, yeah, yeah, I was on one of the Bravo missions. Um, Bravo mission, what's that mean? It's only read a Bravo 2 Zero. 
I went, oh, Christ, yeah. Yeah, Andy McNabb and Chris Ryan, that lot. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, I was on 3-0. And I went, shut up. <laughs> you kidding me? And he went, no, no. I said, so what happened? Okay. Went in, did the business, came out, job <laughs> done. And I, I said, no, well, classic, long-range desert group come special air service activity, which was what the regiment was formed on in the Second World War in North Africa, pretty much, you know? Like you've seen an SAS rogue warriors uh, or rogue heroes as the the, the bbc uh production was of it yeah. and um and i was like oh flipping hell mate and we were going to meet damien uh the following week and going to chat about book concepts and things like that about theirs and i went that's the book uh obviously we went through mod disclosure cell and what you can say and what you can't say you're not mm-hmm. giving any standard operating procedures around and everything else and it that mission well, not actually three zero, but the rest of the, the first Gulf War had been putting several books, including obviously Bravo two zero and Chris Ryan's the one that got away, and you know they sold lots and lots, and there's a lot of interest in the special forces fraternity. Full stop, because people hadn't really, aside from the Iranian embassy sort of siege and everything else, people hadn't really known about special forces until that happened, and then when that happened in the Gulf War, then there was a massive interest and intrigue about. Who are these people? How do they get selected? What are they like? Are they superhumans? What you know, all this type of stuff. So yeah, that's how it happened. So it was from my back garden, <laughs> talking, <laughs> spinning dits about all sorts of bits and bobs. And uh, of course, I've worked with those guys, overlap with those guys doing special projects when I was in the military in the special projects teams. And um, they are, I've got my, my best pals, you know. So it's uh, so it's really fun. When you're doing stuff like that, and the book sold really, really well, and, and Des is currently, currently doing proposal for another book, which will hopefully be out in the next year. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed for him. Well, I'm here for it, man. I want the Paul Who story uh, written down. I'll be the first person in line to buy a copy of that book. Um, now I know you're a private guy, and there's clear reasons as to why you are a private guy, and as you mentioned. We grew up in this, you know, same town. I've never heard this story before. There's a good reason why. Um, so I know you're not a big social media guy, but for everyone listening or watching right now, and they think, I want to hear more from Paul. I want to find out more about Paul. I want to connect with him in some way. What are the best ways in which people can do that? Where can we direct people to today? I do a lot of talks, uh, speaking sort of gigs, really, predominantly for schools, because I believe in putting... As Des Powell says in his Sheffield accent, putting water back in the well, which yeah. in you know normal English is putting water back in the well, and uh, that's what I've done. So I have spoken to oh goodness, well over a million students uh, over the last 14, 16 years or so now, I guess, and I've won awards for just basically being a storyteller and for warts and all, and for saying yeah, failed in school, done this wrong, done that wrong, learned from this, this worked well for me. And I even go into prisons and talk to prisoners as well. So you're talking uh, B category prisons and things like that. So they're, you know, in there for doing bad things. But ultimately, bad things don't make bad people true. You know, if, uh, you, uh, there are some sinister people out there, granted. But ultimately, we need to rehabilitate these guys and girls to come and live back in society and understand where they've gone wrong. And we don't teach the wiring of the brain in school. We don't teach how to learn, you know, and we get a little bit wishy-washy nowadays and scared of actually saying things. So uh, that's where I come from on that type of thing. So I go, go back to your question. Yes, the best way is probably via Twitter. I am um, at MFL speaker. So MFL stands for modern foreign language. So at MFL speaker, that's me. So you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I haven't got a large presence on there. I don't tend to bang my drum uh, particularly hard. And like I said, when you focus on being the best version of yourself you can be, things happen around you and the opportunities. So you'll see me on Channel 4 coming up in the next few months on Celebrity Hunted. So I'm the one coming out with the wacky one-liners, jumping out of all sorts of uh, platforms, <laughs> doing all sorts of stuff. So it, uh, that's, that's good fun. And there's some other TV projects and possibly films coming in the future as well. So uh, watch this space. So I will leave all the relevant links in the show notes below to everything you mentioned there. Paul, 
thank you thank you so much for coming on the show today it's been an honor to speak to you um i know i've mentioned it a few times but we grew up in the same town so i'm shocked i never heard this story it's a story that i believe i and so many more people should hear there's so much value and, and knowledge and perspective that you have to offer um so i hope we get to do this again someday i'd love to do this in person because i think you have a lot more um to give to this show my friend so thank you so much for joining me uh no thank you and and thanks well done mate you've <laughs> you've got a talent there all right so uh keep on doing what you're doing and you focus on being the best you can be mate because you've got a talent well done